Come, Holy Spirit, come now, come as you wish. Come, Holy Spirit, come now, come as you wish. Come, Holy Spirit, come now, come as you wish. As was mentioned at the beginning, this feast of the baptism of the Lord is a, a conclusion of the Christmas season and is very important because it's like the rebirth of Jesus. He was born as a human, assuming our uh, nature, and just after Christmas, he's reborn, anointed with the Holy Spirit for his mission. And it's also very important for our uh, personal uh, life. I remember uh, many months ago, when I was young and beautiful, you know, and <laughs> now it's only end left between, you know, I was studying in Germany, we had Polish mass, and majority of the people, 90% of them, they were young people, students and young workers. And the priest was um, trying to uh, tease us a bit, uh, to show the importance of the baptism, and he said to us, you don't even know on which day you were baptized. You know, when I was looking, I don't. <laughs> I don't know which, which day I was baptized. And he was making a point that in Catholic countries we are celebrating much more Names Day, which is connected with the baptism, than birthday. We're giving this name was given on the baptism day, you know, and the baptism day is an important day when you are connected, infused into the body of Christ. So next time I went home, I looked for this baptist certificate. I was baptized on the 9th of January. But there was another question or another challenge coming from him. Have you ever said to your parents, to your godparents, thank you for bringing you for baptism? I know it doesn't apply that much here because many of you were baptized also as a, a teenagers or grown-up pe people. But in Poland, 90-some percent, they are baptized in the, as the little babies in the, in the church. And I remember when I wrote the letter to, a snail letter, you know, we didn't have internet at the time, and saying thank you for baptizing me, I, I, I got very emotional response from my father when, when he was really moved that he was feeling, well, that was my duty, you know, to bring the child to the church. He even didn't think about this, that the child could be thankful. So this was like beautiful revival of the baptismal uh, promises. And something like this we'll try to do uh, today. Jesus went into the waters of baptism. And sometimes people say, whatever for, he didn't need the baptism. Of course he didn't. But the water needed to be sanctified. The water should be blessed. Jesus goes down into the water of the Jordan to take each one of us, eventually, to be placed in the waters of baptism, to be reborn through the grace of baptism. So God himself will somehow intervene to save us, to bring this salvation closer to us. This is our coming to the struggling point, especially of these Christian communities, Christian dominations, is in baptism symbolic. This is what they would say. If you go to the Bible, you will not find it there. Uh, nowhere does the Bible say that baptism is merely a symbolic act. Uh, that passage, that sentence, simply doesn't exist. And you can always ask for it. Okay, show me where. Uh, they will not find any translation. So let us see what the Bible does says about baptism. First, looking to the Old uh, Testament. I will sprinkle clean water upon you, and you shall be clean from your uncleanness. A new heart I will give you, and a new spirit I will put within you, and I will put my spirit within you. That's the old prophecy from the prophet Ezekiel, which is written in the chapter 36. Here in the Old Testament, we have a foreshadowing of New Testament baptism. <laughs> And if you compare it, it's very clear. So let us see in the, if the New Testament corresponds to what we just read in Ezekiel. Peter said, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. From the beginning of the church, somehow much more was this forgiveness of sins emphasized, that we forget that there is also another aspect of the baptism, receiving the first gifts of the Holy Spirit. 
So note that the, there is no symbolic language here. It's very real and appealing to our personal life. If you compare the Acts of the Apostles with the book of Ezekiel, Peter said, be baptized for the forgiveness of sins. And Ezekiel centuries before said, I will sprinkle clean water upon you and you shall be clean from your uncleanness. It's very clear correspondence. Even the second part is the same. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, as Peter was inviting people. And I will put my spirit within you, uh, said Ezekiel. So can you see how God in the old covenant was preparing us for what he gives us in the new covenant? There is obvious continuation. All of those who are at the Bible study, and I invite you to come back and, and continue with the Bible study, you know it. That is a continuation, there's no break, there's such a smooth transition and uh, raising the bar with coming of Jesus. And now, why do you wait? Peter was asking. Rise and be baptized and wash away your sins. So once more, is very real, very direct language. For by one spirit, we are all baptized into one body. As Paul was uh, instructing, teaching the community in Corinth. So what body was that? The body of Christ. The church is biblical language. The church is the body of Christ. The head is Jesus. The rest of the body are we. So together, head and body forms the body of Christ, his church. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you. So once more, a very real language. Baptist now saves you. Baptist makes us Christians. And Baptist uh, elevates us to the level of grace, which is unavailable just to our human nature. So scripture simply does not support the non-Catholic notion that Baptist is just a symbolic act. It's very real and very impacting on our lives. The truth of baptismal grace is clearly taught in the New Testament, and we have countless proof. Oh, you judge the company by the products, by the best or by the worst. Now, the best product of the church are the saints. You know, so in this way, the grace transforms us to the amazing level that they are given to us as an example, as an encouragement to use these graces. The sacred writers tell us over and over again, it is through baptism that we are saved. It is through baptism that we are buried with Christ to the old life. It is through baptism that we are incorporated into his body. It is through baptism that we are washed of our sins, that we are regenerated. Through the baptism we are cleansed from the ancient writings of ancient church fathers, it was always explained. They didn't emphasize this Holy Spirit, but because the gift of being regenerating, it's so, so important. So they are unanimous in speaking of Baptists in clearly efficient terms, as something that really brings about a spiritual effect and not just a symbolic uh, performance. So the gift of baptism, you can see also as a problem solution. You know, this is what I saw disappointed with all even this presidential campaign. There is only one man, and he's not a Catholic, who is always returning to faith, always returning to the foundation of our thing. And how, how Baptist, the beginning of our Baptist, and then continuing living in Christ and with Christ could be a problem solution, I wanted once more to share with you Matthew Kelly as he explained it so beautifully. If you sit down and watch the evening news, I think you pretty quickly come to the conclusion that the world's a bit of a mess. I don't know anyone who would say, hey, the world's in great shape, it's moving in a great direction, we just got to keep it moving in the direction it's going. I think if you ask your parents, you'll discover they're a bit concerned about the world that you'll grow up in. I think if you ask your grandparents, you probably discover they try not to think about what sort of world you'll grow up in because it just makes them too anxious. You see, they've seen enough of the change to recognize just how disturbing the trends are. 
So how did the world get to be a, a bit of a mess? Well, do you want the truth? Or do you want some sugar-coated answer? Lots of people could give you, you know, lots of different reasons and answers and excuses, but most of them would focus on one aspect of the mess. They will talk about suffering and death or the collapse of the family or poverty and economic turmoil and environmental breakdown. But these are all just symptoms. What's the disease? I mean, if you get the flu, your symptoms may be a sore throat, a hacking cough, a fever, a runny nose, and, and aches and pains. But the only way to fix the symptoms is to treat the disease. Suffering and death, uh, the collapse of the family, poverty and economic turmoil, environmental breakdown, and whatever else you want to add to the list, these are all just symptoms. But let's get back to the question. How did the world get to be a bit of a mess? The big answer to the question, the macro answer, is that people are sinful and they turn their backs on God. Sin is the disease. And the truth is, sin makes us unhappy. God never intended us to suffer and die. His original plan, his original idea, was for us to live in paradise forever. God's original plan was for ever reigning peace between God, man, and the environment, and harmony between all men and women. Suffering and death are a direct result of sin. In session two, we talked about Gideon from the book of Judges. This whole book of the Bible is a series of stories that illustrate the Israelites turning away from God and then turning back to God. They do it time and time again. They turn away from God and then they turn back to God. Each time they embrace sin and turn away from God, their lives became miserable. Each time they turned their backs on God, they fell into another form of slavery, just like when they were in Egypt. You see, sin always leads to slavery of one kind or another. The same thing happens to us. When we turn away from God, our lives become miserable. Sure, there may be pleasure to be had in the moment, but the pleasure is fleeting. It's not sustainable. And after the pleasure of sin has faded, there's just the misery it inevitably leaves behind. And every sin makes the world a little bit more of a mess. You see, sin and evil are real. Sin and evil are real. And they are not just something that's out there. They're in you and me. We each have the capacity for tremendous good, tremendous virtue. But we also have the capacity for sin and evil. These things are in us. And we have to come to terms with that. If we're really going to live the life that God wants us to live, if we're really going to live life to the fullest, we got to also come to terms with the fact that we're capable of sin. So what is sin? Well, sin is usually spoken about as a, a behavior that is wrong or immoral. And it is, no question, it's that. But the only way to truly understand sin is in the context of the relationship between God and humanity. If you really want to understand sin, you've got to understand what sin does to our relationship with God. You see, God is infinitely good and all his works are good. It is out of his goodness that God created us in his own image and for good. You see, God created you for good. Sin is more than just bad behavior. It is the rejection or destruction of something really, really good. You cannot reject or destroy something that's good without rejecting goodness itself. And God is goodness. And so every sin is in some way a rejection of God. This is why the most devastating dimension of sin is separation from God. When we sin, we put an obstacle between ourselves and God. You see, sin breaks down our relationship with God. It puts obstacles between us and Him. We have a long history of that. Humanity has a long history of turning away from God, offending God, rejecting His goodness. And this is where Jesus enters the story. The central claims of Christianity are that God became man in Jesus, that he died on the cross to atone for our sins, and that he rose from the dead to liberate us from death. But Jesus also came to show us the best way to live. Nobody can teach you more about the best way to live than Jesus. Try this. Read the Gospel of Matthew. As you read about what Jesus taught, ask yourself, are these the solutions to the mess the world is in today? I think you discover they are. I think you'll discover that Jesus has the antidote to the world's mess. 
You see, Jesus is the solution. What does this mean for you and me? Well, it's easy to say, oh, the world's a bit of a mess. But the thing is, the more I become aware of who I really am, the more I discover I'm a bit of a mess too. I do things every day that don't help me become the best version of myself. And most of the time, I don't actually want to do these things. Just like Paul wrote, I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I do. I am capable of incredible good, but sometimes I turn my back on God and His goodness. Sometimes I do it because I'm stubborn and other times because I'm lazy. Sometimes I turn my back on God and His goodness because the right path just seems too hard. And other times because I'm selfish and I just want what I want. The truth is I'm a sinner and sinners need a savior. Yeah, the world's a bit of a mess and I'm a bit of a mess too. But Jesus came to fix the mess. And that's good news. As I mentioned previous Sundays, you can have it on your cell phones. This program is for free. It's uh, very useful from time to time to remind. And that's what is the good news. Jesus is a solution. It's a solution for our personal life and for the world. The, the question is, would you turn to God? Because this is how uh, we revive all the graces of our Baptist. And today, in a very uh, special way, I wanted to uh, give you a chance to renew these baptismal uh, promises in the place as we have usually nice and Crete. It's baptismal promise, which is correct. We can have all three uh, forms in this. And then afterwards, when you will be singing, uh, then uh, I will go through the church, sprinkle the holy water, just to refresh, refresh this, what was given to us on the day of our baptism, and which should grow constantly for our life, that we become, as Matthew Kelly says, the best version of ourselves. <laughs> 